Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast bringing you true crime from around the world. Grab a beer and pull up a deck chair. This is True Crime Island, another true crime podcast. Hi Islanders, well this episode is a couple of days late as I had to wait for sentencing today and tack that on to the end of the show. Now I've been watching this case unfold from the moment it popped up in my news feed back in August of 2018. Now what made the news item stick out was that not only is it a few kilometres from where I live, but it mentioned that some guy had been struck down in the middle of the street with a samurai sword. Now, it reminded me of a random stabbing that took place at a bus stop on the corner of Salisbury Road and Church Street in Camperdown. Now, that's just a kilometre away from this samurai sword incident. But where the bus stop murder was a random killing... The Forest Lodge killing, which we'll talk about today, was far from random. And as the events unfolded over the following days, the story would become fascinating. True crime podcast fascinating worthy. So references tonight are from the Sydney Morning Herald, Channel 9, Express Digest, Google, Court Records and abc.net.au. Okay, so... How does someone end up dead in the middle of a Sydney suburban street with a samurai sword wound to the head? I mean, it's not old-time shogun Japan. And the two perpetrators that were observed running from the scene, well, they're nowhere to be found. Well, first you need to have a healthy mix of drugs, money, and just a few dickheads. Now, this case has plenty of that. So who are the main characters in this crazy saga? Well, first up, we have, and this is their ages at the time, 23-year-old animal-loving vegan barista and failed trainee preschool teacher Hannah Quinn and her 28-year-old boyfriend, D-grade actor and martial artist Blake Davids. Now, this incident unfolded on the 10th of August, 2018. Now, Blake Davis lived at 87A Hereford Street Forest Lodge and Hannah had a place at 46A Sutherland Street St Peter's. Now, that's less than an hour's walk away from Blake's place. Now, the other main character is 30-year-old rapper Jet McKee, a.k.a. Skepaz, Skepaz, I'm not sure. Now, he was in debt, married with a baby on the way. He also had a drug habit. Other than his passion for rap music in which he co-founded record label Subconscious Records, he was an IT worker. Now, I guess we can start off with Jet. As I said, he's got, a, he's got gambling debts and a wife with a baby on the way. Now, he had approached his family to help pay off those debts, but he's also got this drug habit. Now, from what I, it looks like, he was using meth, and we all know how destructive using meth is. Now, I really don't know how much of a user he was other than at the morning of the 10th of August 2018, he had a shitload of it in his system. Now, Jet, desperate for cash after losing all his money gambling, approached a friend of his called Frank O'Connor to help him out. They'd both previously robbed drug dealers in the past, knowing the drug dealers aren't really going to go to the police after having their stash and their cash stolen. Now, Frank was one of Hannah Quinn's contacts. You see, Blake Davis and Hannah Quinn were alleged drug dealers. Now, I say alleged because they have really good lawyers and they've never been charged or convicted of drug dealing offences. But if you read all through the different court records that I have, you'll find that even the prosecutors believe that they were alleged drug dealers. But we'll talk a bit more about that later. So, Jet McKee, he needs money and he also enlists this mate of his, Frank O'Connor, to help him out. Now, Frank knew that Quinn and Davis were a good target. From what he knew of the scale of their alleged side hustle, there was probably a large amount of cash and maybe drugs at Davis's 87A Hereford Street residence. 
So at about lunchtime on the 10th of August, Jet McKee gr- drove to Ultimo, and that, that's just down the road from Forest Lodge, where he parked his car, and then he was picked up by Frank O'Connor. They then drove a short distance to Hereford Street, where Frank parked the car about a block down from 87A. Now, if you know the area, or if you're Googling as, as we speak, it's down towards the Minogue Crescent end of Hereford Street. Now, Jet apparently didn't know Quinn and Davis. Frank did. So Jet got out of the car and approached 87A. But then he saw this woman, who is Hannah Quinn, carrying coffees and some breakfast back to this place. Now, he was at the front of the residence and Hannah noticed him stare at her as she walked in the gate. She then went up the side passage and opened the sliding door where Davis was sitting. Now, the first fatal mistake was here because Hannah didn't lock the door behind her. The next thing that happens is a little bit unclear as the only two living witnesses are Davis and Quinn. Now, Quinn said, and I have edited this for flowing clarity, she said that a few seconds later by opening the sliding door, which was closed but not locked, a man came in wearing a balaclava and armed with a pistol. He told them to give him, give him all their valuables and money. Now, I'll stop here a bit. Jet probably didn't say valuables and money. He probably said, give me all your drugs and money. But this is coming out of Quinn's mouth. Now, Quinn said that he told them that there were more people who would be coming and that there were people who knew their family and would hurt them. Now, at this time, Quinn states that she was screaming. I I guess she was pretty bloody terrified. She then said the guy put some knuckle dusters on his hand and punched Davis in the face and that Davis fell through the open glass doors. The guy then said, give me any valuables. Well, probably give me all your drugs. That's probably what he said. Now, she yelled at him saying, get out, get out. Again, when he said valuables or I reckon he said drugs, we'll never know. But he wasn't robbing them for their valuables. He wanted their drugs and money, allegedly. Now, Quinn said that she had, she had a black bag on her shoulder at the time containing lip balm, her phone, keys and her wallet that contained a small amount of cash not exceeding $50. She said that the guy grabbed that bag off her shoulder and walked out the premises and that she followed as the bag was sort of still attached to her. He then snatched the bag and ran off through the gate. Now Hannah says that she wrestled the guy in the laneway of their premises for possession of the black bag but he successfully took the bag from her and ran out the front gate and onto Hereford Street. She then chased the thief along Hereford Street to recover her black bag with a lip balm and less than 50 bloody dollars, apparently after this guy shoved a gun in her face. And when she caught up to him, she grabbed the black bag and had a further wrestle with him over it. She then successfully wrestled the black bag away from this guy. She said that the thief threw a punch at her, which, which missed, and he lost balance from the force of the missed punch and fell on his knees. He then pointed a gun at her which is the moment when Davis arrived and hit him. Now, Davis, after being hit in the face inside the house, now he stopped, grabbed one of his samurai swords, which he had several because he collected them, and he was quite capable of using these things. He ran off after Quinn and the thief. So when Quinn says Davis hit him, What she means is Davis sliced his head open with one swing of this samurai sword. Now, this split this thief's head right open, and it would eventually be a fatal blow. Now, Quinn was heard to say, What the fuck have you done? Now, Quinn and Davis grabbed what had been stolen off them. Now, she says it was just her purse, but it was probably something a lot more than just her purse. They ran back to the Hereford Street residence. They dumped the bloody samurai sword and legged it to Quinn's 46A Sutherland Street place, jumping over the back fence of Davis's place to get away. Now, Jet McKee, he was able to stand and he fell against a little white Mazda parked off at opposite 138 Hereford Street. Now, that was about 100 metres from Davis's place. Now, witnesses on the scene tried to get him to sit down while emergency services arrived, but he got up and he was able to stagger 
almost another 100 metres down the road, and this is towards Minogue Crescent, where he turned right. Now, Frank O'Connor, he's waiting in the bloody getaway car. He saw him staggering and then collapse in the middle of the road. Now, Frank got out and spoke to him, but realised his friend was dead, and so he legged it as well. Within minutes, police and ambulance had arrived on the scene, and by 2 p.m., they'd sealed off 87A Hereford Street as a crime scene. A balaclava with DNA of Jet McKee on it was located in a pool of blood near where he was struck. A replica pistol and a pair of knuckle dusters with his DNA were found on the roadway near where he'd leaned against this little white car. If you have a look in Google Earth, not so much Google Earth, but Street View, you'll see that little white car still parked there. Over several years, I think whoever bought that car's had it for quite a few years. Now, police would release details of the suspect. A woman described as Caucasian, aged in her early 20s, thin build, about 178 centimetres tall, with bleached blonde hair and dark coloured roots. She was wearing a black singlet and maroon three-quarter pants at the time. Her male companion was described as Caucasian, aged in his late 20s, medium build, about 178 centimetres tall, with short brown hair. Now, I think Blake Davis is a little bit shorter than Hannah Quinn, but that was the description given out, and it went everywhere, all over the radio, uh, Facebook, everywhere was this description. And they've on the run, so that must be quite difficult. So Quinn and Davis took off to her place at Sutherland Street St Peter's where they ditched their bloody clothes. While police searched the surrounding area for Quinn and Davis, they found an Uber Eats food delivery bag with the name Hannah on it containing $21,380 cash, two mobile phones, six pairs of nunchucks and a pellet gun. Now, this was found between the houses at 133 and 135 Wigram Road. And that's just a couple of streets behind Hereford St- Hereford Street. That must have ditched it when they were jumping backyards. Now, at the Hereford Street residence, police would find the samurai sword covered in blood, wrapped in a car cover. Now, this car cover, I think... I, <laughs> I've always thought, where did they get this bloody car cover from? I think they just ripped it off a car in the street because he's walking around with his bloody samurai sword and he's just sort of wrapped it up on his way back to the house to dump it. Anyway, they found the samurai sword covered in a car cover, 122.1 grams of ganja, ganja, I think that's about four ounces, a a baggie of white powder and more than $3,000 cash. They also found an Aldi shopping bag. Now, it had cable ties in it. Now, this Aldi shopping bag was seen to be carried by Jet McKee in CCT footage when he arrived at Frank O'Connor's home prior to the attempted home invasion. Now, the Aldi bag was tested and had DNA matching Jet McKee. There were no other fingerprints or DNA of Quinn or Davis on the bag. At Quinn's place, at 46A Sutherland Street, St. Peter's, police would find bloody clothing. They would also find one brass knuckles container, empty, packaging with the description, premium CO2 extracted cannabis oil product for medicinal use only and not for redistribution. They'd find a machete with a wooden handle, a large glass jar containing green vegetable matter. I wonder what that was. A small glass jar containing green vegetable matter, a glass jar containing green vegetable matter, an envelope with loose notes, a clear resealable bag containing green vegetable matter and a white plastic bag, a bag containing green vegetable matter and a plastic tub under the bed, which was probably used to contain a large amount of this green vegetable matter. Now, it looks like these two need to do a bit more than delete their browser history when they're going to do shit like this. Now, I remember at the time this happened, man killed in the middle of the street with a samurai sword. That was weird enough. But then when it came out that police had found the Uber Eats bag full of cash and weapons, well, this was where it was really starting to get interesting. Anyway, Quinn and Davis... They're on the run. 
At 2.27pm, Davis calls the Adina Apartments near Sydney Town Hall. That's just around the corner from my place. At 3.15pm, footage shows them arriving in clean clothes with Davis wearing sunglasses to try and hide his black eye. He's actually got a fractured eye socket. Now, they check into room 47 and by 3.30pm, they're in their room. Now, they don't stay long. Davis makes some phone calls and they leave with their bags just 15 minutes after checking in. They take an Uber to Hornsby, which is about a 35-minute drive northwest of the Sydney CBD, where they are. Here they visit a friend, but they leave by 7.25pm when Quinn books a taxi under the name of Sarah to the Waldorf Apartments in Pennant Hills. Now, that's only 10 minutes drive away. It's now called the Nasuto Pennant Hills if Apartment Hotel if you Google places as you listen. They stay in room 20, uh, 12, 200, <laughs> They stay in room 212 and Quinn pays 199 bucks via a credit card. As you can see, these things are traceable if you start to use bloody Uber drivers and credit cards. They obviously can't stay in one place for very long. Now, Davis would rack up nearly 60 bucks in 13 phone calls from this room to two of his relatives. But they didn't stay long here either. They called a taxi to take them to Norton Street, Leichhardt, under the name of Jacob. They pay the taxi driver $80 fare in cash. That's a good idea for the half-hour taxi ride back towards Sydney to where a relative has a car parked in an underground car park. It looks like they take that car and drive about 35 minutes northwest of the Novotel at Borkham Hills, which is now, if you're looking for it, Ridges North Norwest Sydney. Wow, this only happened a couple of years ago and nearly every hotel has changed its name. Now, it was around midnight at this stage, less than 12 hours after the Samurai incident in Hereford Street. Now, it must have felt like ages to Quinn and Davis while they've been on the run. They booked one more night at the Novotel and on Sunday morning they checked out. Now, at this time, relatives have been urging Quinn and Davis to turn themselves into police, but they stayed on the run. Now, finally, by about 11 a.m. Sunday morning, they first called Glebe Police Station with Davis telling the copper who answered, I'm really scared. I'm really badly injured. I was involved in the Hereford Road incident at Forest Lodge. Well, he hangs up and at 2 p.m., Quinn booked a double room at the Budget Hotel Big Hostel in Surrey Hills, which is only up the road, which is like I said, back in Sydney City they are now. Now, she does this in person, so she actually just walks in there and uses $120 cash. For some reason, they go to Marrickville Metro, which isn't far out of the city at all. It's just past Newtown, which is one of the next suburbs to the city. Now... <sighs> This is really close close to Quinn's place at Southern Street, St. Peter's. So I don't know if they went and cased the place to see if police were watching it or not. I have no idea. The next day, Monday the 13th of August, they waltz into Newtown Police Station where they give themselves up, but only after getting legal advice. Now, the story they will give police, and they did have a few days to get this story together, and this is, I'm just going to put it together in one paragraph, was that some random guy home invaded them, threatened them with a gun to hand over their valuables and money, hit Davis in the head with the knuckle dusters, stole her purse, ran out the house. She then ran down the street after him and caught up with him, wrestled her bag off him. She, he fell to the ground and then Davis caught up with them and he hit him over the head with a fucking samurai sword. Now, this is all supposed to be in self-defense. Now, the $21,000 cash stashed a couple of streets away, she's just saying, hey, that's just our savings. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure it's your savings. Yes, technically, it's your savings. Yeah, right. Now, across social media, there's details leaked out about this $21,000 in cash. They tried to hide along... They tried to hide this money along with bloody pellet gun and nunchucks. People were posting all over the place that this just doesn't add up. If it was self-defence, how could it be if they were just innocent people that had their home invaded? Look, why not just call police and lock the door? Why chase this apparent scary guy down the road who's got a gun and then kill him with a samurai sword? Now, that doesn't sound to me or a lot of people on social media at the time, like self-defense. It's more like self-retribution, the sort of things drug dealers do when they get ripped off. Now, also, why after they killed this guy in self-defense, apparently, 
Why do they go on the run for days? Why not just stay at the scene and talk to police? So even if they have done this stupid thing of slashing this guy's head to pieces, why not just stay there and go, hey, sorry, this happened, blah, blah, blah. Now, the phones that police recovered were able to show that they were probably allegedly dealing drugs with the usual code words being used, you know, like, hey, coming to see you about Mary, blah, blah, things like that. Now, listening devices would also capture Davis apparently allegedly buying more drugs after the incident, and they would also pick up arguments between Davis and Quinn. They're both sort of blaming each other for what happened. Davis saying it was her customer or contact that did it, and that she didn't lock the door when she got back from the cafe. Now, she's saying it was him who actually hit McKee with a bloody samurai sword, which I can, I really get her point. Now, they would fight, but then the next day they seemed to reconcile as well. So, a uh, bit of a weird relationship. Now, they had great, great legal help getting bail and no drug charges laid on either of them, which I still find absolutely amazing. Anyway, now, they would be charged with murder, but as you know, this needs to be proved. Was it premeditated? And there's another thing. Whether or not Quinn and Davis had acted, say, as a criminal enterprise, that is, they both plan to leave the house, let's get Jet McGee, let's go and kill him together, or had Davis just done this stupid thing on his own after Hannah, Hannah Quinn had just run out chasing after this guy. Now, during their court appearances, they are on bail, so they arrive to court walking down the street together. The thing I noticed on every photo, maybe this was cherry-picking photos, but when they always held hands, Hannah Quinn was always leading. You know when you hold someone's hand and you're walking, the way your hands have to be, that one person will be the leader and the other one follows. It's sort of the natural flow of things. Now, there's one photo that is quite funny. Quinn and Davis hand in hand. Now, she's leading him and the look on her face. It looks like the mother dragging her son after out of school after he's just been busted, smoke and pot. I won't go into detail on the ins and outs of this case. A lot of evidence in regards to alleged drug dealing was made inadmissible because they thought it might prejudice the jury into thinking they're just violent drug dealers and, yeah, now they're just murderers. So in the end, Davis was found not guilty of murder but guilty of manslaughter. Quinn was found guilty of being an accessory after the fact to manslaughter. In court, McKee's finance, Avril Bowers, stared down Quinn and Davis, telling them that they'd shockingly and absurdly portrayed themselves as victims, which <laughs> they bloody well had to. She condemned them for what she saw as their lack of remorse. The life you cut down in such a cowardly way was more than you'll ever be, she said. I feel that you've used every tactic at your disposal to vindicate yourself while villainizing Jet. She also told the court of the pain of giving birth to their son and raising him alone. She addressed Davis directly and said she refused to play into his guilty pretense by reading his letter of apology. She said, you've stolen his life, but not his memory or the love we feel for him. But Davis then told the court he would never comprehend the pain you've gone through. I don't expect you to accept my apology and I don't expect you to take on board what I'm saying right now. But I do, from the bottom of my heart, apologise. Davis said he'd lost part of himself because of the nightmare that had shattered so many people's lives. Good to think of yourself, Davis. He said, I definitely died emotionally and I won't be the same person. Yes, that's a great thing to say, Davis. Obviously, you just don't have... I don't think you have any remorse. The only remorse you have is the fact that you got caught. Now, he told the court his only intention was to save Quinn. Now, under cross-examination, Crown Prosecutor Chris Taylor accused Davis of reciting carefully scripted lines in accordance with his NIDA training. That's training in being an actor. Of course, he's not a very good one. He said, I suggest you're falsely claiming remorse. And (laughs) Davis says back, No, Mr. Crown, I've been remorseful since this happened. There isn't a day that's gone by that I haven't been remorseful and felt shattered. Well, he's been out on bail, so it's not like he's been locked up. Whether or not he really is remorseful, whether or not he feels shattered, I really think 
it's more for what's coming to him. Davis also admitted he still does not accept the jury's verdict because he denies it was his intention to harm McKee. Now, when you go wielding a bloody samurai sword around, and he was he's trained in martial arts, there's videos of him doing, like, uh, what, is it, what do you call it when you audition for shows? There's th- things of him swinging his bloody samurai sword around like a, like a ninja. Uh, so he knows how to use this bloody thing. So going up and then swinging down on someone's head, well, what do you think's going to happen? Also, Davis was caught on a listening device admitting that he says he told police and everyone else that he can't remember killing McKee, even though he really does remember it clearly. Now, he says, I tell everyone I don't remember it, but I can remember it. Oh, and by the way, he asked Quinn to marry him the other day and she accepted. Oh, my God. God, what a power couple, and they deserve each other so much. So today, Blake Davis got five years and three months in prison with only two years and nine months non-parole, which means he'll be eligible for release from prison as early as August 2023. Remember, he's been out on bail all this time, so that time doesn't, it's not like time served. Now, Quinn is yet to be sentenced. Now, I don't think that's long at all, and this does include the automatic 25% discount for pleading guilty early. However, he only pled guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter, not murder. So, (laughs) we ended up having an expensive trial anyway. Look, I think they're all scumbags, but did Jet McKee deserve to have his head split open after Blake Davis acted out some samurai scene? I don't think so. Now, Jet shouldn't have done what he did in the first place. Blake Davis and Hannah Quinn, they may have allegedly been selling a bit of ganja, actually they were, Maybe a lot, we don't know, we'll never know, as they weren't charged over any drug offences, which I think is weird. But it looks like, look, it was only pot anyway. I don't believe for a second that Quinn knew Davis was going to go full-on samurai on McKee, and I don't think they acted together when chasing McKee down the street. Now, these sort of activities attract these sort of people, and you get these sort of outcomes. For Jet, his wife and their baby, they will pay the ultimate price for the stupid thing that Jet did that day. Any money he would have gotten from Quinn and Davis, he would have just lost it with his gambling habit anyway. Davis and Quinn will do their time as well. It doesn't look like they're going to do much time, but it's just a total shit show that didn't need to happen. Now, maybe Quinn summed herself up quite well, better than I could. She said, I'm a fucking junkie, like, really, like, I'm a fucking drug addict who can't fucking put their life together. Now, another thing, Blake Davis, his Wikipedia page keeps getting any reverence to him killing Jet McKee edited out. You can go there, look for his stupid Wikipedia page and check the edits. Every time someone uploads something with references, it's gone. Like I said at the start, this case starred a bunch of dickheads. Okay, let's leave it there and I'll update you once Quinn knows her fate in maybe a few weeks' time. So before I go, a big shout out to all my patrons. Thank you for your support to keep the lights on. As generally, as you know, we only had that Manscape ad come in, so it's pretty much commercial free for all. And special thanks to my new Patreon, Liana Hardy. Thank you, Boom Vakalunga. If you would like to help out, go to patreon.com forward slash true crime island. If you want to buy me a beer, you can shout me out on paypal.me forward slash true crime island. There's links to merch, social media, and my YouTube channel is also on my website. Just go there. There's links everywhere. That's truecrimeisland.com. You can also email me from there. Now, there was a question on Facebook the other day about links to merch. So, yeah, every episode I post links under that post on Facebook. That will have links to a couple of merch stores. And in every description on my YouTube channel, there are links. 
Now, I am for the YouTube people who do listen, uh, watch on YouTube as well. I'm a little bit behind on a couple of episodes, but I'm sure I'm going to catch up soon. Now, I have a promo this week for a podcast I mentioned the other week during the Des one. That is the Murder Mile. So listen to that at the end of the show. So, <laughs> I've been your host, Cambo. You've been listening to True Crime Island. And as I always say, don't forget to delete your browser history. Good night. Boom vagalanga. Hey friends, I'm Michael, host of the Murder Mile UK True Crime Podcast. I would be delighted if you joined me every Thursday for a walk through the untold, unsolved and long forgotten murders of London's West End. Featuring hundreds of fascinating true crime tales you won't hear anywhere else. If you're looking for something different, the award-winning and highly acclaimed Murder Mile UK True Crime Podcast is researched used in the original police files. It's presented as a dramatization. Each episode is crafted as a labor of love, and it focuses on the victims' lives in an honest, detailed, and sympathetic way. Season five has just begun, so why not treat yourself to more than 150 episodes? If that sounds like your cup of tea, search for the Murder Mile UK True Crime Podcast. Thank you.